We ready? Good. All right. Good morning and welcome to the New York City Council's Committee on Rules, Privileges and Elections. I'm Brad Lander, the chair of the committee. Um, I think some other members will be joining us a little later this uh, morning, but at the end of term and two stateds left, it's a, it's a very busy time here uh, at the council. So please don't, uh, don't take it as an insult that they're not here. They're, they're missing out, I, I suspect. So I think they will conclude when they watch the video that they, whatever they were doing is not as good as having had the opportunity to meet our two nominees this morning. But I will introduce the other members as they come. Uh, I want to thank and acknowledge our counsel, Elizabeth Guzman, and the staff of the council's investigative unit, Chuck Davis, the director, as well as Andre Johnson-Brown. Uh, the council committee, uh, and we're joined now as well by our minority leader, Steve Matteo from Staten Island. Oh, we're considering two nominations this morning. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Alameda Sky Chapman for a recommendation uh, by appointment to the mayor to the New York City Youth Board. And then after that, uh, Anne Holford-Smith for the council's advice and consent concerning her nomination to the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission. The Youth Board serves as an advisory body to the Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development with respect to the development of programs and policies related to the youth of New York City. The board consists of 28 members appointed by the mayor, 14 of whom were appointed upon recommendation by the council. Uh, and the board uh, seeks to be representative of the community and include people who are represent social services, healthcare, education, business, industry, and labor. Uh, it meets quarterly and members serve without compensation and we're pleased it would of course be uh, a big mistake if the youth board did not include some young people. Uh, so we're pleased, really pleased that it, that it does. Um, and we're thrilled to have Alameda Sky Chapman here this morning as a nominee for service to the youth board. So first of all, thank you for coming down this morning. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, we do swear people in when we're uh, asking them questions about their nomination to a public commission or board. So if you would please raise your right hand to be sworn or, sworn or affirmed in by our council. Hello. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Chapman, we don't we don't bite. Uh, um, you know, and I don't want to, I don't mean to be patronizing. We think young people have a whole lot to offer, uh, but we also uh, want and we really value your experience and your expertise as a young person. Um, uh, and we're thrilled that you're here. So uh, just feel at ease. I know you have an opening statement. Uh, go ahead and make it. And then uh, Councilmember Matteo and I and Councilmember Rose, who's coming in, will ask you a few questions. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I'm Alina Sky Chapman. Um, I'm a senior at Uncommon Charter High School. Um, last year, I ran a healthy living club in my school because um, I feel like for minorities especially, um, kind of like... Healthy living. And I'm sorry. Can you t oh. pull the microphone a little closer to you, sorry, just so everyone I start can hear over? you? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Um, last year in my school, I ran a, um, a healthy living club where we talked about um, how like class and race like um, affects healthy living in like different communities, as well as how we can live healthier lifestyles, um, things of that nature. Um, outside of school, um, I'm the captain of a row team. I'm a part of the nonprofit organization. Row New York. Um, I've been a part of the team since middle school, um, so this will be my fifth year rowing with them. Yeah. Um, I'm also a part of a community garden with my mother where we spend a lot of time kind of like gardening and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, I think I'm a good fit for the New York City um, Youth Board um, because I think it's extremely important. Oh, a little closer. Oh, I'm so sorry. Because <laughs> um, I think it's important to have youth voices heard, um, especially as kind of like a minority woman to have, I don't know, a voice in government um, is important. That's all. Okay. I'm done. Super. Uh, thanks for that opening statement. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Debbie Rose from Staten Island and Councilmember Margaret Chin from Manhattan. We're first doing the hearing on uh, Alameda Sky Chapman for the New York City Youth Board. Um, uh, just give us the background a little. Uh, you know, what neighborhood do you live in? Uh, where'd you grow up? What uh, you know, where's the school that you go to? Um, I've grown up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, my school's in Crown Heights. Yeah. 
Um, and talk to me just a little about what you think the major issues are facing young people in, in New York City. You're going to uh, be appointed to this board whose mission is to try to develop programs and policies that support young people and address the key issues they're having. So if you could just tell me a little bit about what you think those issues are and, you know, what, how you'd hope to push, you know, push us forward in doing better on them. Okay. Um, I feel like education is a really important issue. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> you, and, and that is totally fine. We got not, you know, uh, we, we go, we're a nice bunch, but yeah, so just. Yeah, I think my, por <laughs> my priorities will be kind of like education and expanding the scope of after school programs um, regarding kind of like accessibility and individuality um, kind of like within those programs. Um, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And I was interested to see that you're, you know, both the captain of the row team and, and active with Row New York, which, as you point out, is not something that is, you know, normally associated with young women of color. Uh, so it's great that you're doing that. You. Uh, tell me a little how you got involved and, and what that, you know, what that brings to you, why you like it, what you, how you think it helps. Um, as you said, rowing is um, usually a sport that's kind of like in accessible in cities and to like people of color. Um, I kind of found uh, the organization kind of as an accident, sort of. Um, my mom really wanted to me to be a part of like a sport, so I kind of just like randomly signed up. And it overall is a really amazing community. Um, Row New York fosters the development of kind of like youth all across New York City. So I meet kids who go to private schools and public schools and. Um, of all races, and I think it's, it's really amazing. They offer you academic help, and we travel, and they take us to like college campuses. It's, um, it's a really amazing kind of program, I want to say. Right. Well, I'm glad your mom had that instinct. I, I have a high school daughter who I also felt was not as, you know, engaged <laughs> enough in athletic activity, and I, I pushed her to get involved. Now, she signed up at her high school for the ultimate Frisbee team, which may be the only, which may be the only sport less representative than rowing. Um, uh, so um, I'm glad that you found Row New York and that, that has been, uh, that's been such a successful thing for you. Um, uh, let me see whether uh, any of our other colleagues have have questions it's great to get to hear from you and uh, it's wonderful to meet you and, and know that young people like you are taking leadership um, in their own lives in their schools and then we're also providing some opportunities to help that be uh, have impact citywide any questions from yeah. council member chin hi good morning welcome I see here that you ran a healthy living club yeah so yes. my question is that do you think that should be part of the um, school curriculum, you know, from elementary school, middle school, and, and high school? Um, most definitely. Um, I feel like no one really knows anything about, like, how to eat or how to take care of yourself. Um, in my school, um, kids drink, like, a bottle of soda and a bag of Doritos and call that breakfast, and I just I don't think that's any way to live, and I don't think... I don't know how they survive, honestly, just like eating chips <laughs> every single day. Um, yeah. So maybe you could advocate for that in the youth board. Yes, I and hope work so. with us. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Council members eat like that too. Well, I'll take this one question further. So, you know, what DYC does is funds programs for young people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder what you think would, you know, makes a good, so let's say, all right, we all agree, okay. all of us, students and council members, have a lot of unhealthy habits. Yeah. The whole city would be better off if we had more healthy ones. You know, what's the kind of program that, you, you know, DYCD should fund uh, and what would make it more likely to be successful in getting young people on a, on a healthier path? Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> I think that there's like a lot of kind of like stigma about vegetables <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> so um, when I like introduced uh, the club to my school, like no one really wanted to join. Um, so a lot of kids were kind of like forced into it. And everyone was kind of like, I'm never, this is disgusting. <laughs> I never want to eat like this in my entire life. Um, I don't know what it, like salads are gross. 
So I think you can like still eat well and like, I don't know, I think we just kind of have to change the idea of what like healthy eating is. It's like, it's not, I don't know, just like eating a tomato and calling that like dinner as like my peers think it is. It's more holistic than that. So if, if you come at it with like a more holistic approach then kind of just these are the food groups you need to be eating, more of like this is what the food can look like and things like that. So, yeah. Well, we'd love to continue that conversation with you as you join the youth board. You may know this council was uh, pushed very hard to get universal mm -hmm. free lunch to remove the stigma of kids eating free lunch, uh, school lunch in the first place. And some people, like Councilmember Vaca, who was just cracking us up downstairs in leadership, <laughs> I know he invested a lot of money in the renovation of the uh, the cafeteria mm -hmm. in one of his big high schools, with the goal of just making it a place where. You know, like the difference between sort of a food court model where you might want to eat and an old cafeteria where you might not. So I think we'd love to continue the dialogue with you about what we could all do in this, in this regard. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else have further questions? No. All right. Uh, Ms. Chapman, thank you very much for taking the time to come this morning. We really appreciate uh, thank you. Thank you for and having me. We don't vote the way these hearings work. We do the hearing now. We talk to each other. We want to make sure our colleagues on the committee who didn't get to meet you know what a mistake they made. Uh, and we'll vote uh, in the committee next week before the full council meeting. But I feel very optimistic that your nomination <laughs> will be approved overwhelmingly by the committee. So thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. Okay. All right. So we'll uh, we'll close the public hearing on Ms. Chapman's nomination uh, and turn now to our second nomination for the morning. Um, in a letter dated December 6th, Mayor Bill de Blasio formally submitted the name of Ann Holford Smith for the Council's advice and consent concerning her nomination for appointment to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. If we give our advice and consent, uh, Ms. Holford Smith, a Manhattan resident, will fill a vacancy and be appointed to the LPC. Uh, and be eligible to complete the remainder of a three-year term that expires on June 28, 2019. Uh, we've done a fair number of LPC appointments in this committee before, so I won't go into detail about its responsibilities, but the Charter has a good deal on it and its responsibility for establishing and regulating landmarks and historic districts. Uh, the LPC consists of 11 members, um, and that must include at least three architects, one historian, one city planner or landscape architect, and one realtor. And it also must include, amongst those people, one resident from each of the five boroughs. The mayor appoints the members of the LPC with the advice and consent of the council. Um, and when appointing a member who is for the architect, historian, city planner, or landscape architect position, the mayor consults with the, or may consult with the Fine Art Federation of New York or a similar organization. Uh, and we have staggered three-year terms. One of the uh, members of the LPC serves as chair and another as vice chair. Um, the members, not including the chair, but the others serve without compensation but are reimbursed for necessary expenses incurred in the course of performing their duties. Um, and we are glad to have Ann Holford Smith, who uh, is an architect and uh, will be introducing herself and then we'll ask questions as well. Uh, committee members, you can find a written copy of her opening statement, her resume, etc., in the red booklets as usual. Um, Ms. Holford Smith, if you would raise your right hand to be sworn or affirmed in by our council. Hello. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, please now proceed with your opening statement. Great. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Lander and members of the Committee for Rules, Privileges, and Elections. Thank you for the opportunity to stand before you and answer your questions. I'm extremely excited and honored to have been nominated by the mayor for a seat at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I'm a born and bred New Yorker, born in Brooklyn and raised in Queens, and for the past 30 years have lived in the nexus of Chelsea, the West Village, and the Meatpacking District. I spent much of my childhood in Forest Hills Gardens, uh, a, a bucolic and charming environment that introduced me to urban planning and design at an early age. I was enamored of the Tudor-style buildings and brick roadways that made the garden such a special place. My parents also instilled in me a deep caring for meaning and place. Our summer vacations always included pilgrimages to historic places from the battlefields of Gettysburg to Monticello and Mount Vernon. 
Our own Tudor-style townhouse was a constantly evolving project led by, led by my father, who, as an interior designer, was always bringing home treasures to be somehow incorporated into our home. I later attended Pratt Institute in Brooklyn to study architecture, which introduced me to a larger world of the built environment and further solidified my love of old buildings. I've been practicing architecture for 30 years and have spent a considerable time, amount of that time dedicated to preserving historic buildings in New York City. Most of that time has been with Platt Bayer Devel White Architects, of which I am now proud to be partner. My late mentor, Paul Byard, was a renowned preservationist in New York and served for many years as the Dean of Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Preservation, and Planning. Together, we worked on the restoration of several important New York City landmarks, including the Cooper Union Foundation Building, the Pellet Division Courthouse, Gould Memorial Library Auditorium, and Flushing Town Hall. For the Cooper Union Foundation Building and the Appellate Division Courthouse, we were able to return those amazing masonry buildings after 100 years and more of very hard wear to a close semblance of their original appearance and restore the meaning that their original design intended to convey. For the Cooper Union, that was the forward-thinking freshness and opportunity that a free education could provide, symbolized by its many large windows and the use of the most up-to-date materials for 1859. For the appellate division, it was the bright white symbol of truth in law as embodied in the classical idiom. Both of these projects benefited from my technical expertise in building envelope, including stone restoration, wood window restoration, and ornamental metalwork. While these were pure restoration projects, the opportunity to transform old buildings back to community, community use has been even more rewarding. Flushing Town Hall was restored from an empty shell to a vibrant center for the arts. Our other work with institutions like the Lower East Side's Educational Alliance will provide new generations the chance to grow and learn in the same building in which their parents did. And the restoration of the auditorium of the Gould Memorial Library in the campus that was once the home of NYU in the Bronx returned light and original details back to a space darkened to discourage bombing in World War II and vandalized by student radicals in the 1960s. These projects included both restoration and architectural inter intervention, merging my technical preservation expertise with my architectural practice. I have honed these skills on projects throughout the five boroughs, ranging from preservation master plans to full building restorations and adaptive reuse. It has been my privilege to work at one of the most preeminent preservation firms in New York, working alongside not only Paul Byard, but Charles Platt, who himself served as commissioner in the 1970s. I have spent the past 30 years committed to the restoration of New York City landmarks, sensitive additions to old buildings, and new buildings set in historic contexts, and am now committed to the public service of helping to oversee the stewardship of this incredible city that I call home. That stewardship includes not only the preservation of individual landmarks, but the creation of clear guidelines to inform the development of new construction in the context of historic districts. New York, while embodying a unique amalgam of its history from Dutch to Amsterdam to the brown decades of brownstone construction, is still a growing and changing metropolis that needs to be allowed to evolve. The combination of the new and old is what makes New York such an exciting environment in which to live, work, and visit. Allowing sensitive and invigorating new buildings and additions to coexist with the fabric of our older buildings is crucial for the future of the city. Again, thank you for the opportunity, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much for that uh, opening statement, uh, which is a very good demonstration, I think, of your uh, extensive qualifications for the position. The LPC and council members' experiences sort of um, tend to be two different kinds of debates about it. On the one hand, there's the preservation versus development uh, debates, people, whether they got to grow up in Forest Hills Gardens or not, um, loving the city and its kind of historic nature and small scale and uh, trying to grapple with the challenges that a growing city and its development demands and how to balance those things. And so that tends to be, um, you know, our constituents want in that side more preservation faster um, to preserve things they're afraid of being eroded. And then on the other hand, our homeowner constituents come and say it's a big headache to have to get an application through the LPC, um, you know, and we want that to go smoother when we're doing some simple work on our home. I just wonder if you could say a little about your perspective on, on both of those issues. Sure, I think, um, I think that the 
the process has gotten a lot more streamlined and a lot more efficient um, and is currently working better than it had been. I know in the, historically there was always in this sort of feeling that, you know, if you have a landmarks building that, you, you know, it takes forever to get things done and it's more expensive. And, and I understand that the process has gotten a lot better um, with homeowners and landmarks under this administration has gotten um, be more sensitive to that. Um, this could always be more improvement in, you know, maybe in terms of public outreach to people so that the process is more, more transparent, people understand it better. Um, and I'll just interrupt you there before you go on to the, to the first one. I, I think that's, I mean, in my experience, that is right. It, it certainly has, there are more things that can be approved at the staff level than were previously. Technology is used more effectively. It's more often you get a quick turnaround. So all of that progress is real and good, and I'm grateful for it. And I also think it's good for commissioners to find ways to stay in tune with, you know, your sort of average homeowner uh, who's not a person who's really in the big preservation development debates, is not someone who generally otherwise will kind of appear before you, um, and just make sure that we're operating the system in a way that is, uh, makes sense to them. Or it needs to be equal across, across the board. Yeah. And a lot more, you know, individual homeowners than there are major developments. <laughs> and so... And rightly, balance. most of those things don't come to the commissioners. You know, staff level approvals right. for things which are minor work mm -hmm. um, are wonderful. So, uh, but staying attuned to that is a, is a valuable thing, I think, for council members to make sure that commissioners are doing so. All right, and then just give us your broad perspective. We don't need to drill down too much, I think. Um, and you and I had a conversation yesterday that makes me clear you're just a thoughtful person about how to balance the needs of a growing city and the, the requirements of meeting the housing uh, demands and growth demands that we have with the love we have for our, you know, the built environment and our neighborhoods and wanting to strike that balance just as, as well as we possibly can. So talk about the perspective you bring and maybe, you know, share one or two examples of, of how you've tried to balance that in your career. Sure. I think um, you know, we have a, a great building stock in New York City and some of it is very historic and worthy of uh, individual designation and preservation and some of it is simply just nice old buildings that we want to maintain and keep and I think that certainly in, in establishing a district it's important to and you know not having done this personally it's it's some you know I, I hope to learn this as I go if I'm appointed um, you have to sort of you know balance looking at a, an area those buildings that are truly standout buildings that should be designated as individual landmarks or um, cited as being contributing to the district. While there are probably a vast number of buildings within a district that are not, not necessarily contributing but are sort of handsome buildings. And I think it, we need to maintain that kind of a balance in order for building owners to develop those properties to their fullest potential. Um, in res with while also respecting the district. Um, Just maybe give us an example or two from the work you've done. I mean, I know your work has been more on the restoration of historic buildings. So I should say right. I also... Um, I hadn't noticed till I was just peeking at it, the work at Greenwood Cemetery, which is just some wonderful, yes. wonderful work. So thank you for that. Um, uh, but, I mean, just give us an example of sort of a place where, you know, in your professional world you were balancing between these pushes and pulls of uh, development and, the, you know, the, the, the desire of owners to build the building that they believe made the most sense for them under the zoning and the rules and the, the pull of neighbors and a community seeking to preserve context as much as possible. So we had a, a building that was a bit controversial several years ago that was in the Carnegie Hill District in 91st Street and Madison Avenue that was originally a one-story bank building. And the owner, the building, the property developer wanted to put an as-of-right residential development, um, which we designed and com within the zoning envelope um, with the proper street wall and setbacks and a, a, a tower above that wasn't that tall a tower because it couldn't be for that district or that neighborhood. Um, but we did come up, come up against extreme uh, opposition by the, by the 
community. Um, and it was a, a process of, of back and forth with community boards and working with the preservation staff at the commission to come to a building that was ended up being um, a shorter building, which was the predominant comment that we received, um, but also because we made it shorter and in order for the developer to be able to have a usable building, it had to fill out to the entire building envelope. So instead of being a slender tower on a base, it became a little squat building, which unfortunately we, we felt was, was not, as, um, not as good a building, but it, it meant you know, we were able to work with the community and the commission and the building owner to come to this resolution that met everyone's expectations and needs. And yeah, I mean, that's in some ways, you know, there are, I mean, you know, the LPC relative to, let's say, the Board of Standards and Appeals, which is, you know, supposed to have a tight set of technical findings. The LPC, we want people with expertise who have thoughts about aesthetics and design, and we have members of the public testify, and sometimes what that results in is a balance in which, you know, there's something kind of in the middle, which right. the, on the one hand, the design professionals don't think is the best design building, and the neighbors don't think is exactly what they wanted either. You, you feel comfortable you know, uh, you feel like you can add value in those conversations oh, and decisions with yeah. the LPC. You know, seeing it from the other side, you know, as a commissioner, obviously I would be looking at it differently, um, but having the experience of, of presenting before the commission and working through those design pro processes will definitely inform my, my work if I chosen to become the commissioner. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's any question looking at your resume and uh, your bio and hearing you today that you've got all the qualifications and experience that uh, we would want. One challenge in finding people for the positions on the LPC is that the people who have the qualifications and experience we want quite often got it by being in places where they appear regularly before the LPC, which, which you have done and your firm has a lot of business. And, and that presents a set of conflicts that it's our job, along with the Conflicts of Interest Board and our Director of Investigation, just to make sure we uh, have fully disclosed and know exactly how they're going to be handled. So um, I know you received a waiver from the Conflicts of Interest Board concerning your partnership and your role at, at your firm, uh, that your firm you know, has projects, which some of which you've worked upon and some of which you have not, uh, and will continue to have projects before the LPC. Um, it's my understanding, but I guess I just want to ask you to kind of clarify and, and affirm the ways you're going to follow it, that... Um, uh, you will cease to work on and have no personal involvement in the projects involving landmark designated properties that would go before the LPC, and that includes not participating in discussions, emails, conversations, conference calls, or receiving documents, um, and also in, in, a, in one further step, not being compensated for uh, the firm's work before the LPC, um, so both, sort of both a firewall on the firm side and, and also non-participation in those matters on the LPC side. Um, so let me just first, like, is, you know, if, uh, is, am I, is my understanding correct or can you just explain to me how, you know, how you'll proceed to, to Yes, do that? that's correct. We um, provided a very detailed letter that explained the projects that we're working on, had worked on in the past and are currently working on that had come before Landmarks. <clears throat> um, right now it's about a third of our projects that come before landmarks. Um, so we will set up a policy in the firm and obviously let tell the staff that um, I'm no longer able to work on any projects that come before landmarks. And so any conversations or emails will have to cease. And, um, and we have several other preservation professionals in our office who are more than capable of handling the projects that we have. Um, and I'm currently working on other projects that are not before Landmarks. Um, and in terms of uh, compensation, again, we, we track every project so it's clear, you know, what project is this profit or loss and which pro project is the Landmark project, and very clear and very easy to separate that. And so I will not be compensated for any work that comes before Landmarks. So, and so there are a couple of projects that will come before, that you've worked on already, that will come before landmarks. I guess, how will you handle right. those? 
So I'm working on um, one project right now at 462 Broadway, which is um, actually winding down. Um, and my, one of the associates of the firm is working on it, as well as staff and partner, Sam White. And so they will continue working on the project, and I will step down if I'm appointed. Um, and then we have another small project, which is a, a, a storefront restoration, which is just getting started, which I, another associate will take over, and I will cease working on. And I mean, it's my understanding that you became a partner last year, on which congratulations, though that makes this a little more complicated because obviously it's easy enough to pay you salary for work that you did before a certain date on projects and not pay you salary for work you, on projects you won't be working on after you would join the LPC, but just talk a little more in a, in a partner role about how you plan to uh, not benefit from the profits associated with these particular, the projects that come before the LPC, um, you know, in addition to the more clean hours, you know, billing, right. hours of right. billing. So we have a, a, basic, a basic payment for partners, basically like a, like a salary, um, and that's just sort of across the board. And then uh, beyond that, there are, depending on, you know, profits and losses on projects, um, distribution of those to partners. Um, but again, since we can track each project, every project has a project number, and we, at the end of the year we, we know exactly what each project has done, um, this, those projects would just be excluded from any further bonus or you know, compensation that I would get. You do distribution of profit and losses by project in a way that makes it possible right. to draw yes. a line and not have you... Um, and they won't go in some, and this is not to say you would do this, but we've seen these things in the past, they won't go into a sort of you know, fund in abeyance oh, that no. you can pick up no. later, they get paid out, they would be... No. Okay. Um, okay, and I'll just flag for uh, members of the committee, um, the ones who are here and not, that all of that is detailed in the letter and the, and the COI guidance. It is, yes. Oh, it is. Yes. 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 Um, so, and um, uh, we may have further, you know, I think because uh, it is our, you know, in, in, it's often the case that members don't necessarily dig in on those things till we do this, uh, and that's partly why we don't, in any cases, vote on the day of the hearing. We do the hearing. We give members a little time to sit with the information. If there are any additional questions that we have about this, we can call you back before we vote next week or be in touch about it. Um, Councilmember Rose, any questions? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Chair Lander. Um, I, I, I appreciate that you were able to get into um, some of the nuts and bolts about um, your partnership and how we're going to um, keep you safe in terms of uh, being able to recuse yourself from projects that are going to come before the Landmarks Commission. Um, and I want to congratulate you. Uh, I'm sure um, as a woman, you worked really hard to, to get there. Um, and so I was just con concerned about the distribution of the work um, and maintaining the firewall. So I, I think the chair delved into that quite e effectively. Um, what I, I'd like to know, as a person who is used to being on the other side, uh, speaking to the commission, um, are there any parts of the process that you think should be streamlined or, or worked on and, and might, you might focus on um, once you become a commissioner? Well, I think one possibility is to possibly in, increase the amount of work that can be done, uh, can be, that can be approved at the staff level. Um, that could be something that would could streamline the process and make things go more smoothly and would then take less time at public hearings. Um, we had, at one point, we had a really l large calendar backup. Um, and this council I'm really proud of, you know, worked hard to eliminate that calendar so we could move forward. Um, are you seeing... Um, that projects are being expedited um, as quickly as possible? Are we on track 
are we building up any kind of back backlog? Well, again, not having the firsthand experience, I'm looking at it from the other an, from the an other outsider side, true. Uh, view. But it seems to me that when I when I hear about a project that's sort of being considered, and it seems to have to be going at a very a very good pace. And well, as as a person who has presented before the commission, do you find that the process is expedited? I do. So when we typically present something before the commission. You know, for a hearing, there could be comments that, that come from the commission, and uh, we're usually able to work with staff to do those changes if we need, if needed, and to work through anything, any revisions, and so the process can take place without having to go back, usually, to for a second hearing. You know, for a larger project, more complex, sometimes you have to go back for a second hearing, but I think that the staff has been very, really good. For the in, most part. Yeah. Doing well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. No, definitely, and I, you know this goes back to the to my first question. I think there's you know for on big projects uh, where the the owner or developer hires someone like you, then you know I think they're in good shape. You know the the the, the challenges we hear tend to be on homeowners who and look I. I want more landmark uh, districts in my district, so I don't I say this is someone who believes in them a great deal and wants to see them expanded. You know, you, you don't want a homeowner who's redoing their stoop to have to hire a premier architectural firm uh, and how it can work that both things can be true, that protections against the kinds of uh, encroachments that we don't want can be protected against while also making it just as easy as possible for people to do uh, non-encroaching and not particularly consequential small work is so that's absolutely I know Councilmember Rose and I both yeah, represent I are enthusiastic about our landmark districts and represent a lot of homeowners who uh, can run into those challenges so um, good uh, any other questions just a comment I love Tudor style also <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, that's an excellent yeah, that's place it. to leave this uh, leave this hearing. Um, as I said before, we'll uh, you know we'll, the committee will go into recess. Um, we and other members will take a, a deeper look at the materials. I think you've done a very thorough job. Again, your your qualifications for this are unarguable, um, and your uh, approach to the conflicts questions are, are thoughtful and detailed. So other members will take a look. If we have any additional questions, we will be in touch and reserve the right to call you back, but otherwise uh, the committee will meet next week. Okay, thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much for your time and your interest in serving, which we really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is now in recess.